Welcome to Shop Talk. This is Jim Silver. I'm with Jennifer Lynch, Hi. my co-host. And we have a special guest today. We have somebody from Mattel. Are you excited? Yeah, I am very excited. <laughs> so we have Richard Dixon, the COO of Mattel, to talk about Mattel, what mm -hmm. they're doing, and a little, a little bit about Mattel through the years. Richard, welcome. Jim, thank you. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. Great having you. Thank you. So let's jump right into it. You left Mattel in two th around 2009, Barbie 50th anniversary. You were running Barbie, yep. great times. You went back around 2015. What transpired in all those years that Mattel was soaring and brought them to a level that they were struggling? Yeah, well, it was um, kind of almost a bittersweet return, right? I, I left at a, a great moment for Mattel yeah. with Barbie. It was a great ride um, and was invited back to um, what turned out to be a pretty significant challenge. Uh, clearly, Barbie as a brand had been experiencing double-digit declines. Uh, the company was um, strategically looking for growth, but spent more time talking about how to grow, uh, and essentially the sort of bureaucratic and process of discussions of how to grow versus really spending time around innovation, marketing, studying the consumer, and building essentially our brands and new brands. Well, just to go off of what Jim just asked then, and you brought up um, product innovation, mm. was also kind of had a few years of struggle there. Um, and 2018 seemed to be a year, though, that you guys really started getting things back on track. You know, we saw that with um, Jurassic World license. That was something that I think fans really responded well to. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you brought back Polly Pockets, Little Gleamers, and um, also brought some innovation with Flesh and Frenzy as Love well. That game. Yeah, yeah, it's a great that is one. A good one. So, um, what do you think internally you did to kind of write the direction in terms of um, product innovation for yeah. the company? So, I think you know, the, Mattel has a storied history, and and you know it better than anyone. Um, uh, and I think part of our history, both kind of good and challenging, was a a period where the company almost became more concentrated around packaged goods. Uh, operational efficiencies, um, driving, if you will, the middle of the PL versus really understanding our consumer, connecting our brands to culture, inventing and innovating and celebrating ourselves as the toy company. Yeah, we didn't think of you for a while as a toy company. It was perceived yeah, as a packaged goods company. Yeah, and I think the reputation that we got in the marketplace was, of course, big Mattel, but very corporate, um, almost linear. Uh, a bit difficult to deal with because mm -hmm. of our own processes and bureau bureaucratic ways of operating. Uh, Do you think operating. it was playing it too safe in, to some degree? You know, I don't know if the company really thought about it playing too safe versus we were really insular. Mm -hmm. right? I, I don't think we were as focused on what was happening on the outside okay. of the company, in the industry, with consumers, uh, and we spent a lot of time uh, being insular, mm -hmm. you know, with our own processes and our own roadmaps and um, to, it, to a large extent, while very good, right? We got a lot of great you know, progress through that. I think over time, you know, it cost us in, the, in relationships, in invention, in mm -hmm. innovation. Uh, I do think uh, 2018 was a great return to much of the attributes that is uh, indications that we're getting it right. right. Jurassic was awesome. Awesome. Um, we did. I'm a big Jurassic World it, fan oh, yeah, myself. Yeah. Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. I grew up with the toys, it and awesome. it's just. It's, yeah, we it loved felt it. like it got back in touch with where the original line was and what excited the yep. collectors. And yeah. Everything. Well, we appreciate it, and so did a lot of other people. And yeah. I think it shows when you really invest in product, mm -hmm. when you empower the designers to design the most magical and innovative toys, when you give them the uh, tools and the means to go do it, and then you execute against that, you're rewarded. And I think it's going to be a best case study that you'll see more and more as Mattel gets back its mojo and we get more and more back into the business of innovation and making kids around the world happy and excited to parents play. excited <laughs> to see them happy. Now, one of the areas that's been really hot has been Hot Wheels. I, mean, yes. I, think, I think 2018 was the highest sales year ever of Hot Wheels. Ever. Yeah. However, at the same time, and I think this is a good thing, you took Chris down, who I've known for years, yeah. tremendous talent at, yeah. at Mattel, running Hot Wheels. Now, Chris has a new job at Mattel, which changes Hot Wheels a little bit. Can you fill us in? Yeah. What's, what, what's Chris now going to be doing and any other changes with Hot Wheels? Sure. Well, Hot Wheels is um, one of the greatest brands of all time in the toy industry. 
uh, I, even in the automobile industry. I think we sell more cars than any other uh, car company in the world. And last year was the biggest Hot Wheels year ever, uh, which was also the 50th anniversary for Hot Wheels. There's a lot of reasons why, but one of the most important reasons is the leadership. Chris Down, who's been leading the Hot Wheels brand, was a designer, uh, originally was a designer at Mattel, grew up uh, at Mattel as a designer. When we appointed him the, to the general manager of the Hot Wheels brand, it was controversial to put a designer in charge of a brand. Uh, but we were confident in Chris's ability to see the vision that he had for the brand, empower him, give him the tools to do it, and sure enough, the last few years of Hot Wheels has been unbelievable. Now we're taking Chris's skill sets to the next level, uh, and we promoted him to the head of design for all of Mattel. He will be overseeing design and development as the portfolio of brands, bringing his now commercial and marketing acumen with his designer skill set all together to really lead innovation and invention for the whole company. Yeah. Is that that's for Barbie? That's for Fisher Price, Power Wheels, everything for all of the brands. Fisher Price, uh, because of its proximity here in New York, uh, and with Chuck Scoven, who's another right. incredible talent that we're so lucky to have back at Mattel. Uh, Chuck will lead the Fisher Price Design and Development Group along with the marketing for that brand, and Chris runs everything else from a design and development perspective for Mattel. Is this changing your philosophy about maybe having other designers run divisions? Yeah, you know, I've always been um, a believer in the creative, uh, and certainly the designer skill set I think is not just applicable to design, but design thinking. And as a toy company, you know, we're, we should be design led. We should be consumer minded. We should be inventing the next big thing and also figuring out how to take our legacy brands and continuously reinvent them. And that is a designer mindset. And so I think when you surround designers by the right skill sets, um, the career path could be as high and as much as the person would want. Well, um, so last year Hot Wheels was the 50th anniversary. This year it's all about Barbie, yep. uh, 60th anniversary, which is kicking off this month. So um, looking back at 2018, those two properties specifically were really kind of the highlights um, in terms of Mattel's earnings. So looking at Barbie, what do you think helped to write the direction of the brand? Obviously, um, it had four years of kind of down sales there. Yeah. Mm, do you think yeah. it's product driven? Do you think it's changing the messaging that is resonating more with parents? Yeah, the, the truth is with Barbie, uh, it's everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It really is everything. I mean, the, the question of how do you keep an 11 and a half inch doll relevant mm. uh, for 60 years, particularly uh, now, when kids are playing with digital before they even are introduced to fashion dolls. Uh, so it, it's not an easy uh, thing to keep a brand like Barbie mm -hmm. going. We did a lot of work. The, the most important work that we did was listen to our consumer. You know, they told us Barbie wasn't as relevant as she used to be. She doesn't look or reflect what girls see in the world. Mm -hmm. She's not as aspirational as you profess it to be. Uh, right. And she's not that fun anymore, you know? <laughs> so in the context of what became um, our challenge was it was everything. Our marketing communications, our product, our innovation, our narrative. Uh, so we almost started from the very beginning. We went back to Ruth Handler and we said, well, what was the original intent of the doll? Mm -hmm. It was to inspire girls to limitless potential and to be anything they wanted to be. So what does that mean today? When you look around the world and you see how women look and how girls see it, we needed to show diversity. We needed to show inclusivity. We needed to start to reflect Barbie as Barbie is in culture. And so playing that out, obviously we're enjoying that resurgence and double digit growth means that something's working yeah. and we're really proud of the product. I love that you added diversity within Barbie. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us about the argument internally because I remember it, that can you add diversity in Barbie, mm -hmm. add different skin tones versus this is Barbie, that Barbie's blonde hair, blue eyed. Yeah. And I know there was a lot of fighting within, and you eventually reached a decision to yeah. add the diversity, different hair, different eyes, different skin. I mean, can you give us a little bit about the thinking yeah, behind that? You, you know, I think any probably big brand with legacy is going to have um, a, a lot of challenge to change, right? Because you're rooted in what was, and what was made us so successful that changing it is scary. And especially with a brand like Barbie that people have such emotional connection to how she looks, what her size is, uh, and all okay. of that is part of the history that we had to poke at and really challenge. So there was a lot of controversy in the company and a lot of discussions around how far do we go. 
We have always had in our history moments of diversity that were celebrated, but it was never the primary messaging for the brand. And that's what really changed. It was presenting the brand through merchandising, marketing, visual, product, assortment to really reflect diversity, not only in ethnicity and skin tone, but also in body shape. And um, the team did a brilliant job at executing against it. We, of course, studied our consumer. We studied every scenario possible. And eventually, we just took the leap and went for it. And we're being rewarded for it. And now, you know, we really feel the power of not only what it means to really make, obviously, little girls inspire them to be whatever they want to be, but the power of Barbie as a purposeful toy to really talk about the narrative of cultural relevance and empowerment for girls and the fact that we're living in a day and age with that's part of the subject we all talk about mm -hmm. is, uh, is more uh, encouraging than ever that Barbie's on the forefront of that conversation. Well, Who would have ever you, thunk it? I think oh. you've also done that a little bit with the Shiro's line and also um, mm -hmm. with the Careers line, which is really picked up and that seems yeah, to be awesome. a, a big seller for you guys awesome. right Four now. Four years ago, um, the, we didn't have uh, much business in the career doll segment. There were sort of special dolls. Mm -hmm. uh, we established what we call the I Can Be series where we celebrate the role models and careers. And, and to your point, we honored Shiro's out there, inspirational women who have achieved what little girls can only dream of achieving. Uh, we pulled that together and today, uh, that business is the fastest growing segment in the brand. We'll do uh, 200 plus million dollars uh, already in that wow. segment alone. And, uh, and it continues to have it's double digit growth. It's well, yeah. inspirational. It's inspirational, exactly. It can and be it's anything so, you want to be. And it's such a uh, proprietary owned position for Barbie. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the world of competition, it really is, um, it's a moat. It's a competitive moat. We own it and it's uh, ours to continue to Especially uh, important to message for today's time. Well, and I exactly. think it also plays into the whole Dream Gap project as well. Like perfectly, yes, they perfectly that. aligned there. Yeah, the Dream Gap is um, an incredibly important project to us and a great evolution to the work that we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, it's this moment in time that we researched uh, that um, basically suggests at age five or six, uh, girls don't believe that they can achieve everything that a boy can. And it's very uh, mysterious as to why, right? And I think that's what we're trying to bring awareness to. We have to solve the dream gap. We can't have girls five, six, or any age believe that they can achieve everything that a boy can. And so as part of the Barbie brand's proposition, we've um, established what we call the dream gap with a fund that's mm -hmm. going to be raising money including money from Barbie, to bring awareness of the dream gap and help solve. And it's a great purposeful place. The brand will, um, will have impact in the world. Yeah. So um, a few years ago, Mattel was at its height in the fashion doll category with Monster High, Ever After High, yeah. Barbie, Disney Princess. Yeah, yeah, Disney, Disney Princess. Princess. Name a few. <laughs> you, had, you, had, name a few. you had four lines. We had four all lines. of the great ones. Yeah. Now it's just Barbie. Well, we have other brands, but we're we're certainly working on in the fashion establishing doll. In, the, in, the in the fashion, fashion. doll category. Uh, so the you next are kind here. of oh for sure. Anything we're, we're you getting, can share already? Can uh, we expect something this year? Maybe you can expect something this year. Okay. Yes, uh, there will be something very special this year. Okay. Uh, and there are lots of different projects in work. Uh, getting back, if you will, our prominent position as the fashion doll leader. And we haven't lost the market share in fashion doll. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly we're still number one, but we should be innovating and inventing and coming out and taking swings and building that next monster high right. or next big fashion doll. You'll mm -hmm. see it soon. <laughs> when you returned to Mattel, you had a chance to work for a lot of CEOs in a short period of time. Yes, it true. seemed like CEO <laughs> rotation yeah. for a few years. Yeah. Uh, however, the new CEO, Ina, Kreitz, yeah. he's different. You know, I had a chance to meet Enon. I really like Enon, yeah. and he feels very different. Uh, yeah. What does Enon bring to the table that's quite different from other CEOs that you've worked with? Yeah, I, uh, Enon is certainly um, is certainly different than uh, than many of the CEOs yeah. that we've had at Mattel. You know, I, I think Mattel's um, legacy um, has, uh, in the last 20 or so years, was led by packaged goods leadership. And mm -hmm. there's a lot to be said uh, for packaged goods leadership. However, I think it also sacrificed many of the aspects that Mattel was missing most. Entertainment, content, media, uh, innovation, and a real appreciation for connection of our brands in culture. 
Inan um, comes to us with enormous experience in that space. Uh, he is an expert in the space. He comes connected to the community. Uh, he's versed in how that business works, and he really sees the value of Mattel not only as an innovative toy company, as its origins, but as a company that has enormous value in its IP. So when you look at Mattel's intellectual property, of course, Barbie, Hot Wheels, American Girl, Fisher Price, Thomas, but brands like Eight Ball, brands that like Masters of the Universe. Well, are you the toy you business master. or are you the children's entertainment business? Well, I think you're watching the company evolve from a toy company into an intellectual property company that bridges entertainment, digital gaming, fashion, uh, and ultimately is on its way to become a very powerful children's entertainment company. And I think we have all the foundational roots to get there. Um, and Anon is the leader that will certainly unlock that potential. And I am enjoying working with him um, more so than I ever would have imagined. We, we talk 10, 12 times a day, uh, shorthand, longhand, seven days a week, and it never grows old. And it's, uh, it's fun. The other thing that stands out about him is I don't think he loses. Or, or it's like yeah. he only knows one way, and that is I'm going to win whatever it takes. He's incredibly driven. Yeah. Uh, he's precise. He's decisive. Uh, but most importantly, I think what a great attribute for, uh, for Inan, in my observation uh, as the leader of Mattel and as a leader, uh, is he listens. He's a great listener. He's patient, uh, he listens, but when he acts, he acts decisively uh, and, um, and is able to lead with conviction. And ultimately, I think that uh, as an attribute, particularly at Mattel at this time, is something that is, uh, is incredibly valuable and making a difference every day. Yeah, well, it definitely seems like you've picked up your entertainment side of the business a lot mm. this year. What is it, five feature films this year? So far. So far, okay. wow. so far. Um, and 22 animation. So um, what's yeah. coming down the pipeline first? What are you most excited about? Wow, well, first of all, I think as part of Inan's um, deliberate entry into the company and, and association with unlocking IP, mm -hmm. we've hired great talent that comes to us from those industries. So yes, experts, Robbie, Robbie Brenner, Brenner. Or, yes. who's a superstar mm -hmm. in Hollywood and now um, a superstar at Mattel, unlocking our property in theatricals. Uh, we have Adam Bonnet, who's come to us from Disney. He was there for 21 years. Mm -hmm. um, before that, he was at Nickelodeon. He, he uh, oversaw the Disney Channel there for quite some time, developing some of the greatest shows that we all know. Now he's running Mattel Television, which we've just announced yep. a slate of 22, 22? projects. Yes. 22 mm -hmm. animated series. I know, it's so good. <laughs> it's so exciting. Now, now, is this all for TV, or is we're looking also YouTube? We're also well, cross channel. Let's call it screen, right? Okay. It's, and it's certainly in an omni channel world, right. but this uh, particular effort is mostly television. Uh, there, there will be, of course, YouTube and, and other platforms uh, for us, but it's, uh, it's primarily episodic, mm -hmm. uh, both animation and live action. Uh, you know, a, a series of opportunities, everything from preschool uh, all the way to tween. And it's, uh, it's quite a slate. And the when conversation- When will we start seeing, after 2020? Oh, for sure by 2020. Okay. For sure, by 2019. Well, I guess the, well, I guess the Barbie well, movie is rolling out later. Well, we do have projects, so, right? We yeah. have Barbie, of course, and, and Thomas, Man, and and, um, and Masters of the Universe is in the works, and there's some other really good projects that we're working on. But for sure, in 2020, there's going to be a, a lot more to uh, to be revealed, and but we'll reveal it along the way in 19. And um, any other any other little tidbits about the Barbie movie? And Margot Robbie. You know, there's always curiosity about <laughs> yes. the Barbie movie, and, and we certainly have been here before. Yes. Uh, and there's a lot of storied history. Yeah, but I think Margot I, Robbie's a lot better than I Amy think, Schumer. I no think, offense to Amy Schumer. <laughs> you know I, what? No, it, you better take that back. Amy was a, she's quite the talent herself. Oh, she's an unbelievable <laughs> talent. I don't think it was exactly the right fit for Barbie. Yeah. Well, look, there were a lot Depending of mechanics the that That's we got true. through. And uh, Inan certainly uh, is an expert in that space yeah. and, and helping clear a great path. Margot Robbie is incredible, uh, talented, passionate, uh, and certainly uh, a personification of what we believe will be a great narrator mm -hmm. uh, for Barbie. But that's all I can tell you for right now as we, as we develop the creative, but it's gonna be epic. So how do you well, think though um, the entertainment side is going to help your bottom line overall for the business? You know, I think that the most important thing to realize is that we are a toy company today, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that we study our consumer, we study the industry, 
We invest in our people, we get the best talent, we empower them to do the creative that they need to to make great toys. Mm -hmm. From there, we have intellectual property and brands that can translate to consumer products, digital gaming, content, whether that content is on YouTube, television, or big screens. We have a franchise group that we've established that runs parallel to the toy group, so they're vo both working together but very separate mm -hmm. to unlock the value both in toy and non-toy, working together from a creative perspective. The entertainment business is one that always has been at Mattel, but it's been more in the form of marketing for toys mm -hmm. versus a business by itself. Now we're really moving into these businesses as verticals. There's money to be made in theatrical, not right. only for toys, but in theatricals. Uh, television shows are bought because they're great television shows. They also sell a lot of merchandise. Digital gaming is a frontier that Mattel IP can be engaged pretty pronounced engaged and, and we haven't been, so mm -hmm. we're getting into that space. And consumer products. We've always had a great consumer products business uh, and the last few years we, we've been a little slow there and so I think you're gonna start to see a lot of ramp up in that space as well. Let's talk about Fisher Price. You know, Fisher Price has struggled over the last four or five years. Mm. Within the industry, uh, there's been a joke that the magic was cost reduced out of the toy. And yeah, a, uh, uh, <laughs> I know, but, but that, that's just that's just reality. Yeah. Yes. You know, they lost they lost as the innovation leader. However, yeah. you mentioned you brought back Chuck Scothin, who was at Fisher Price during their glory years and yes. really understands the brand. When are we going to start to see new products, to see a change, and see Fisher Price start to rebound? Yeah, I, I look, I think uh, the magic out of the box is, uh, was a signature phrase um, that, that we really prided ourselves a lot on at Mattel. Uh, and I do believe that some of the magic out of the box uh, certainly happened at Fisher Price more so than at our other brands. Yeah. We are uh, incredibly fortunate, and, uh, and personally, I, I enjoy uh, working again with Chuck Scothin, who we were lucky enough to recruit back to Mattel to run Fisher Price. Um, and as you know, Chuck has a storied history at Mattel. His, uh, his heydays and most successful days were running the Fisher Price, uh, Fisher Price brand. Having him back, uh, first, and foremost, first and foremost, was a huge morale boost for the campus. You know, having a champion like Chuck come back to Fisher Price I felt Price like was it was magic. the prodigal son was returning. It was totally that. It <laughs> yeah. was totally that. He, yeah, he got a standing like, ovation uh, when he was announced. I heard um, there was people were clapping when they got the email. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like they, no, people were clapping at the email. It was like. He was. He is uh, an industry legend at Mattel uh, for, for that brand in particular. So we've hit the ground running. I, I can tell you, Chuck has been at it with his team. Uh, deep in the bowels of Fisher Price, uh, invention, innovation, development, engineering, design, consumer studies, and marketing. But and it's, it's not flipping a be. switch. It's not flipping it's a switch. switch. No, you it's can't not just a, no. You in can't. the toy industry, you can't do it, yeah. and people realize it, it takes time. It takes time. It takes time. You know, product development takes <laughs> it takes time to get the lines out there. Marketing takes time to re-engineer. Mm -hmm. It takes some time. The good news is we will be introducing a few new segments in 2019. Wonder Makers, which we showed at Toy, right. the Toy Fair, That's looks great. awesome and the reaction has been great. We've got some great new role play items with mm -hmm. a new aesthetic uh, yeah. that's really appealing to millennial moms, which we've been frankly slow in. Yeah. So I think getting in that game is really important. We're relaunching Rescue Heroes. I know, you're Rescue Heroes is right. coming so back. Yeah. It's coming back, which was a great property for Mattel and Chuck picked that up right away and was like, let's get that going. Uh, there's a few more that I can't reveal here that are coming back strong with Fisher Price. So I think you're really going to start to see us uh, flatten out for 2019 and then really grow in 2020. So you mentioned Millennial Moms for Fisher Price. Um, I think that uh, American Girl is another brand that Millennial Moms, Millennial Gift Givers yeah. kind of like have a real nostalgia for, but it's kind of been a little flat over the years. And um, I just wanted to get your sense of what you're doing for the brand to kind of write the direction of it and kind of bring the magic back to American Girl as well. Yeah. And I, I want to make one thing. This yeah. is personal to you. This is it's, personal this to is, me. This is, this is, this is, I want to put yeah. it because the, uh, Jen I, really knows American Girl. Grew okay. up American. I, I'm the, I'm, I grew up with American Girl. I even went to Samantha. the American Girl Williamsburg okay. experience back in, <laughs> way back in the yeah, day. Yeah, good. So, but it's, it's something that I know talking through my own friends and stuff yeah. that it's it's a brand that I think still resonates with this audience and moms wanting to share that experience with their kids. Yeah. So I just wanted to get a sense from yeah. you on Well, that. thank you for being a fan. <laughs> and, uh, and fortunately, we have a lot of loyal 
followers yeah. of the brand that are still very loyal and mm -hmm. connected to the brand. But it's true, American Girl has had a really tough go uh, the last few years. Part of it due to, I think, like brands like our generation kind of taking a piece yeah. of the pie as Yeah, well. the, certainly we've been competing with private label and, mm -hmm. and price points that are um, um, you know, not in the same league as American Girl, but offer similar play patterns. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the premium nature of our brand and the content that we provide and the experience we provide is very different, but right. we haven't told that story in a relevant way. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you see brands like Barbie as a case study and Hot Wheels as a case study and Fisher Price, which is a case study to be revealed very soon, uh, I think you're gonna start to see the same with American Girl. We're spending a lot of time listening to our consumer, mm -hmm. studying the industry, understanding the price line architecture, evaluating the new experiences that we have at American Girl and making them more relevant today, recognizing that content is such an important part of the right. brand, uh, and we just haven't told our brand story mm -hmm. well enough or meaningful enough, and that also will change. We just announced MGM uh, is our partner for a movie for American Girl, as I mentioned, is part of our 22 uh, slate series of uh, television projects. American Girl is, of course, uh, one of those uh, brands. Mm -hmm. And more importantly as well, we're really concentrating on making sure that the product and the price points match the consumer interests and needs. So you'll see a lot of change with American Girl. We believe in the franchise. Right. It's a beautiful brand. It's a special brand in the industry. Uh, half of our business is done in e-com, mm -hmm. uh, which is an incredible stat when you mm -hmm. think about where the world is moving and the fact that we have this robust uh, channel and interest. Uh, and we're going to be doing a lot more work understanding and challenging what is the American Girl story today. What better cultural conversation today right. for us to have than what does it mean to be an American Girl today? Mm -hmm. Just imagine that and think what can we do with American Girl? And that starts to get you to realize how we could start, start to spark yeah. uh, real relevance and interest in the American Girl brand again. So in terms of uh, the channels for retail, you mentioned that um, a big piece of the business is e-commerce. Is, was Amazon successful with, in terms of that partnership with Amazon and selling through there, or is it more focused also, on the? Yeah, you also had you also had Kohl's. Yes. You also had Toys, Toys R Us. Us. I mean, yes. is it, what's you know, the retail it was strategy strategically, be? It was strategically well intended. Okay. Um, and and while uh, you know as thought out as it was, it didn't succeed as well as we would have liked. Yeah. Uh, the reality of taking American Girl outside of American Girl just didn't work. Well, I mean, I grew up with the catalog. Mm -hmm. That's That was the way, That's right. and I feel like maybe the channel-wise, it, it wouldn't play out, as you said, That's in right. these other channels. Yeah, so it's, I don't think that uh, I would write it off as a never again. Right. Uh, but I do think that we have to carefully curate mm -hmm. what we do outside of American Girl channels, why we do it, what the consumer offering should be, uh, and in the meantime, I think retrenching in our own four walls or in our own digital experience <laughs> Um, getting that back to be a more robust uh, and appreciated consumer experience is mm -hmm. what we're focused on today. Richard, a brand that people don't talk about a lot is Mega Blocks. Mm -hmm. Now, Mega Blocks is the number two construction company in the world, but there's a g big gap between number two and number one. Yes. And it seems like it's somewhat stagnant. Yeah. Uh, what's being done with Mega Blocks to try and re resurrect it? Well, I think the most important thing that you just said is we are the second largest construction uh, brand in the, in the toy industry, and there's a big gap, which means that we have a lot of space to grow. Uh, that being said, I think the origins of Mega that got us to be as big as we are is being a challenger brand and a challenger mindset. And the last couple of years, I think we got caught up in some, I think, higher value propositions and different forms of marketing that ultimately uh, didn't succeed as well as we would have liked. And now we're going back to more of a value play, mm -hmm. really introducing more value for the consumer, uh, recognizing that licenses are an important part uh, that we could leverage and partner with licenses that are not with the leading player. Uh, we've got Pokemon, which is doing phenomenal, and we're taking advantage of building some great worlds with Pokemon. Other uh, licenses that are coming our way, Game of Thrones, which is really cool. Uh, well, that's very cool. Really yeah, cool. I didn't know that. Well, they had it at Toy Fair, but um, it was we, last minute. Yeah, but it okay. was last minute, last and we minute. weren't allowed to show anything. Yeah, about it was it. last minute. So I think you see um, the collector piece of the business really coming uh, into the mega portfolio. I feel like IPs are really important. Developing your own IPs. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So we're working carefully on it, and I think the more that you're going to see from Mega as a challenger mindset, developing our own IP in construction, 
uh, and also barring what we believe we can get as an opportunity to build upon entertainment properties in a, in a really pronounced way is going to be part of the value proposition. We believe in construction. It's a great category. We think we've got great opportunity in the preschool space to continue and also in the core space as well. Are you going to still incorporate your own IPs within Mega? I, that yeah. is something that was done and I felt it was done, uh, sorry to say, poorly. Yep. And when I say That's poorly, fair. a few years ago, Barbie was incorporated. Yeah. And, it was incor well, yeah, and it was incorporated, but Barbie was incorporated age six and up. Yeah. And yeah. I looked not at it and said, shouldn't Barbie, yeah, shouldn't Barbie be three and up to yeah. get the younger no, kids? No, Jim, you're right. It was, uh, it was a flawed execution, right? It had him had a blip on the radar, yeah. as many propositions do yeah. when you just introduce them. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the play uh, experience didn't match the consumer as well as we would have liked. So we certainly are gonna come back into the arena in construction play with our IP. Uh, that being said, we will reveal it as you know the yeah. schedule suggests. And I'm suggests, sure talk to your consumer base a little bit. Of course, bit. Yeah. yeah, of course. But yeah. it's a it's a great category. It's a great play pattern. Our brands should be in it in a pronounced way. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the means, the resources, and the brand and capability. We will get it. It's just taking a little it's bit a more time. Five billion dollar category. Yeah, yeah, it's phenomenal, and we're we're the second largest player in it with plenty of room to grow. So looking ahead into Mattel's Magic 8-Ball, mm. um, what do you <laughs> predict the next two years will look like for the company? I think you're going to see innovation, creativity, marketing savviness, and the spirit that was always at Mattel mm -hmm. come back in a robust way. I think you're going to start to see Mattel win more licenses, uh, gain more attraction and credibility in the entertainment community, have some surprises in the context of new products, new ideas, and new relationships. And I think you're going to feel the innovation and the spirit of what is a true creations company come alive. I think when we look down the road 2020 and beyond, I think the evolution of the company from toy into entertainment will be much more pronounced. And as you see all of the movies that we're announcing now start to actualize, the merchandise that coordinates with them mm -hmm. will start to be what the calendar looks like. And it will change the dynamics of what is Mattel. So it's an incredible time to be at Mattel, recognizing the power that we have as a toy company and where that's going, and the added layers as an IP company and the possibilities are what continue to fuel me and certainly the culture. It feels like, you know, outside looking in, that Mattel's finally turned a corner. Does it feel that way entirely? Uh, there's no question. There's no question. I mean, you know, the spirit of the company is getting back. You feel um, energized, you see the work starting to resonate with our consumers. You feel our partnerships recognizing that we've made a lot of progress. I think we've gotten simpler in the context of how we run our business, mm -hmm. more pronounced on the right things, and it's showing up on the scoreboards. And you feel uh, the energy and the momentum and the wind behind us versus in front of us. Um, some self-inflicted that are now in our past in the rearview mirror uh, certainly some that were industry related, Toys R Us and similar you know, issues, but I think we fared well and I think now that we're getting momentum, it's going to start to really show up on the scoreboards. Richard, thank you for joining us at Shop Talk and don't forget to subscribe to Shop Talk as we have new leaders and people associated with the industry coming soon.